Um, I'm Diane Lauder. I'm a captain with Marathon County Sheriff's Department in Wausau and a member of the State Board of Directors, Vice President for the last few years. I lose track. Um, I, you've already met Judge Carter, and I want to introduce to you today someone that you, I think everybody in the room already knows. He probably doesn't need an introduction, but... Make another good one. <laughs> I'm going to read what your secretary said. Oh, let's, let's I haven't approved this, so I have, I have no idea. Dave Perlman teaches a number of law enforcement at training schools and conferences every year. A nationally recognized expert in the area of search and seizure, he has delivered more than 2,000 presentations. As an assistant attorney general with the Training and Standards Bureau, Dave Perlman coordinates training programs for both police and prosecutors. His areas of expertise include constitutional law, use of force, public records, and management liability. Prior to joining the Department of Justice, Dave Perlman served in a, as an assistant district attorney in Chippewa County, where he prosecuted cases both in adult and juvenile courts. He also has expertise and experience in criminal and municipal law as an attorney with a private firm. That was in Wausau? That was. That's right. You, you're very familiar with that. Yes, yes. Stories. Yeah. And you know, uh, my disbarment proceedings never took. No. <laughs> I'm all right. Okay, that's great, man. Let's welcome Dave Pearl. Dave. <laughs> Dave, come on over here. We'll try to center ourselves so that Scott can uh, make a spectacle of us. On the internet. <laughs> Put us on the tip button site. <laughs> People will say, I, that's the guy who did it. That's it. That's no, wait, the other guy. Well, they were both together. Yeah, they're yeah. both together. So yeah. we're going to uh, hit some topics here. I'm going to intentionally keep us away from one topic that we might otherwise talk about, which is uh, distinctions and the importance of uh, the significance between uh, anonymous information or anonymous informants and confidential informants. Uh, otherwise, I don't get to wear my clip-on tie and hear Dave speak tonight at the banquet on that topic. So For some reason, uh, that's considered good banquet humor, confidentiality yes, of tipsters. That, so that's we'll, right. So we'll you will be that. rolling in the aisles or in the mashed potatoes and chicken. So it, it's going to be good. I just want to make sure I know my crowd. We're all cops, right? How many here are not cops? Oh. But you want to be, right? You want to be? Okay. Well, we have, <laughs> we have not cops. So that, that means presumably they're unarmed, but now they're with cops okay. judge, so they <laughs> could be back. <laughs> yeah. or, if, or, or do we have any other Texans in the room? Well, they're well, always back. Unless the guy from Illinois, he can't have a gun. But he makes fun of cheese heads, but in Illinois, they're wusses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no firearms and cup fans. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're on page three, if you're following along. And... Uh, uh, we are going to save some time for questions. Uh, we may or may not have enough time for answers, but we are going to let you ask questions because it's really exciting. The uh, uh, I'm going to it's in no particular order, but uh, uh, one of the things we'll start simple uh, and end up really dumb. But but we're going to, at least we're moving progressively. Uh, law enforcement officers who work in the Crime Stoppers program. Uh, in my opinion, there are times when they wear two hats. That's not literally, but figuratively, in that they have a relationship with the Crime Stoppers organization, with the board, and they're the liaison, if you will, between the Crime Stoppers Corporation and the law enforcement agency. And you get to where you start doing things, your, your, your first name basis, you're real friendly, and everything is going well, but then sometimes... It, it becomes uh, uh, mixed where you have to wonder which hat you're wearing at the time. By that, the best example could be when your chief of police or the head of your law enforcement AG, agency for which you work has a different opinion as to what your activities should be as the uh, law enforcement coordinator of the Crime Stoppers program. And uh, he or she may say, you need to remember you are responsible to your employer, to, to the uh, governmental entity that employs you, and to me as the head of the agency. And you need to remember that you have rules of conduct, uh, of general orders, and so forth. But you have, you have uh, duties and responsibilities. Occasionally, this will come up when, for example, someone is on a witness stand. They think they're there as the Crime Stoppers coordinator to testify in the case. And uh, the, the board may be saying, don't you dare 
give up the, the identity of our informant or give information that will lead to the identity of the informant. And uh, the board expects you not to. On the other hand, and I'm not saying this happens all the time, but the law enforcement agency head will tell you, when you go in there, you better tell the truth. And if you don't, you're punishable uh, for perjury, aggravated perjury. Or remember the parallel, you can be disciplined as a law enforcement officer, as an employee. We can terminate you and definitely suspend you, suspend you temporarily without pay. Lots of bad things can happen. And then there's the little things that are uh, in, in between there that can happen. And so sometimes there's almost a conflict of, of interest or a uh, divided loyalty that a Crime Stoppers coordinator may have because they're the peace officer and they're the friend of the Crime Stoppers organization. And uh, if, if you have any comments or questions about that area, I'd like to you know explore that with you. If not, we can move on. We can always come back to it later. But have any of you had these situations where you find yourself in a real bind because you you, you wear two hats? Okay, we got a few hands up there. Anything like that? Share? Yeah, I, or I had, I'm a detective and I also wear a firefighter program. So we had a homicide and we had a homicide and I thought that uh, they were going to So I had contact with her. She was afraid to tell me. I knew she was. I knew she knew where the gun was, but she was afraid to tell us. And I said, "Well, I understand you're afraid. If you know where it's at, call Crime Stoppers." So then she did call Crime Stoppers. So I was in a position then. Do I? How do I write my report in the sense that we had a Crime Stopper call to tell us where the gun was, which we later located in that spot, or do I? Is then when I get called on the witness stand, they're going to say, well, do you know who called that gun in? I would know who it was. So then how do I answer the defense attorney when he says, do you know who the person is that called? Honestly, I'd have to say yes. Hopefully the DA would object, but if they don't, <laughs> what do you, I mean. Yeah, you're in a real bind. See, I look at it like three different ways. That way, maybe one of the answers will be right. But I look at it as a, as a former retired judge where I'm going to say, you better tell the truth. I look at it. Let's, go, let's try the other two out. Okay, let's try the <laughs> as, as the Crime Stoppers legal advisor or whatever, I'd say, let's look for a loophole. Let's okay. delay. Hour, let's hour answer it another <laughs> way. Uh, then, then as the union lawyer <laughs> representing a police officer who may be disciplined, I say, well, maybe we can put some political pressure on the judge not to put you in a position where it's contempt of court or disciplinary action or, or prosecution for perjury. Let's see if we can buy some time delay and see if uh, uh, the, the judge might reconsider uh, uh, th this approach or see if the DA can work it out with the defense attorney. Sometimes buying breathing time helps a little bit and it lets people find out that, that there's another way of handling it. But the, the, the reality of it is, uh, it's almost like civil disobedience or whatever, or, or don't do the crime if you can't do the time. You know that ultimately you're going to get busted if you don't tell the truth. But but you have a different spin, perhaps. No, I, I do. But when I understood your question, you were focusing first on the police report, even before we got to the issue of testifying in court. Right. And I can't preach this enough. I'm just trying to echo what the judge said. <laughs> um, the other judge. <laughs> <laughs> it, the, the truth should always be in the police report. The police report doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be evidence, doesn't necessarily mean your DA can't do what your DA can't do, doesn't necessarily mean we can't find a loophole. But no case is worth intentional misinformation in the police report because where, where do you, uh, where are you detect it? Beloit. Okay, in Beloit, maybe, yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> a big urban area. So what, so what I did was Burn the report and then kind of work <laughs> off there. No, so what I'm saying is you, you got to put it in your report. So what I did is I went to the DA and I said, here's the dilemma, what, what do I do? And they said, well, put it in your report. It was a confidential source right. that provided the information um, as to the gun's location. So then my report also indicated that the, the and kind of another twist, the person um, the person calling Crime Stoppers was probably known to the defense as to who it was, too. So that was kind of, I, in the back of my head, I'm thinking she probably would have been asked, is this the person who called? 
why we had that question on the floor. But you can't say 100%. I could have, though. I mean, I, well, I, I, well, let, well, let's stop there. I was kicking like you were, but it's obvious that he could. But, but let's think about this. Did you ever see them in person, or you only heard a voice? No, I talked to her three times. In person, you're saying? Yeah. We're, okay, we're well, trying that, to give you cues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, like See, but I, didn't wanna, I, I wasn't going to take the stand sure. and, and not tell the truth. No, I like it when you haven't seen them in person. Uh, you talk to them on the phone. You're you're pretty darn sure that's the person by the voice. But then then I go through this routine where I have the lawyer ask you questions. Have you ever seen uh, another person named John Biner? If you, you got all the people who impersonate voices, and then you teach your prosecutor how to impersonate a voice so good that wow, that's good. So you say anybody can sound like sort of like somebody else. So all you can say is a person that sounded like that person, but it could have been. Could have been somebody wow, else. You went a long way from to tell the truth of this yeah. guy. <laughs> so all of a sudden, so, we're, let me just say, I appreciate this now. Was um, this person who talked to you obviously was close to the perpetrator or knew information about right. the perpetrator? Right. So it was afraid of the perpetrator. Right. And you knew her through the normal course of your detective investigation. You bump into, I'm assuming her, I don't know. Right. You bump into her and you believe that she has key with, key testimony. Yeah. She won't give it up to you because she's concerned about her anonymity. Then you give her an opportunity to try Crime Stoppers, because that will give her a cloak of anonymity. And then she does take advantage of that, but in recontacting, you're still confident it's the same person. And now, uh, do I put the, what I put in my report that my confidential informant got re, uh, converted into becoming an anonymous Crime Stopper <laughs> tipster? Which goes to tonight's uh, presentation. I think, I think your DA is probably correct. I would just you could just go CI with that. The Crime Stopper thing is almost, so it's it almost actually, irrelevant. It actually settled the case, so I never actually seen what happened. We no, but it's a good question. I think the Crime Stopper thing almost becomes irrelevant. She was your CI. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think it's a little bit irrelevant. She was CSI. I mean, I, I'm a chief of the Illinois Cops, too, so yeah, I've had, I've had people back in the day that would call up and I'm like, okay, yeah. You know, I'm very familiar with giving information. This is treated as an anonymous tip. Homicide. I don't ask your phone. I just get the tip from the information you source back. You have, so you have a middleman. You have somebody in between so you, so you can honestly say, don't know who it was. I can hear a voice. So the DA said you do it at the conference of court, so we give it to the outlaw motion. Then the judge obviously would make the deciding factor. Right, I think that's the prudent advice in your case because you, you couldn't do anything else. But we're never going to in our police reports. We can couch things, we can uh, state things that are true. But maybe not complete, but we can never put it in all these information of police reports. It's never worth it. Your credibility would be shot forever. And Beloit, I joke, but Rock County is small enough that you don't need it for one case. Once a judge, uh, that, that, right. judge knows somebody. That, that's right. I've never changed my opinion of some, some people I've met in the past, even though they may have rehabilitated themselves afterwards. I remember them the way they were. That's the way they were. Yeah. Uh, and, and on the ethics issue, it reminds me a little bit in. In Crime Stoppers, we sometimes use this uh, term of funneling. It's one of our various F words, and we say that fondly. But, but the ethics involved, for example, someone gives information to law enforcement. The law enforcement agency at that point, when one of their, their uh, officers has it, but they have that knowledge. Sometimes they even extrapolate and call it collective knowledge rule or mm -hmm. whatever. That, if, if, that. if somebody owns it uh, or owns the information, there that you assume that they share that or have the ability to share it with the department. We sometimes have ethical issues where which arise where a, a law enforcement officer receives the information from somebody who didn't even want a reward at the time, weren't, weren't really thinking about it. At that point, they gave it all up to you. Then instead of using that the way you probably should as a peace officer, you think, well, I want to help them. So, so you say, call back in and we'll, long story short, sometimes there's this ethical dilemma where, in effect, somebody's going to the board of directors to their monthly meeting and saying, and here's uh, case number XYZ, and we believe that a reward of $300 is appropriate because this person gave a crime-solving tip to Crime Stoppers, when in reality what you're saying is, Dear Charity, we would like to trick you into giving $300 for information that our law enforcement agency already had, but we're going to act like we didn't have it so that you can pay a reward. 
So these are things that sometimes become dilemmas and ethical problems that you have to deal with. Finally. Yeah, it's almost like you're using Crime Stoppers to launder these mistakes. You know, once it's out of the bag, you can suddenly go through the Crime Stopper cleanser. And, and some of the informants may not be real smart, and maybe they were never intended to give testimony, but when they get up on the stand, there's no telling what will fall out. And if, and if in the criminal case it comes out that, oh, man, he told me to call Crime Stoppers. He, and I didn't call Crime Stoppers for two weeks, and for two weeks he did that thing with the information that would solve the murder or whatever. So you got to be, be careful who you, who you trust. And, and first you got to trust yourself to make the right, right judgment. Uh, let me, uh, and we're just throwing stuff out there, see what sticks on the wall that you're interested in. Well, that's good. A lot of times we do dodge a lot of bullets by what happens. Uh, sometimes just the passage of time, we just pray to God that that, that works, and, 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 it, and, it, and it does. Uh, here's some minutia, just so I can teach you something, or we can teach you something that you'll probably never hear discussed at any other Crime Stoppers training conference, but so that you'll be prepared in case some nut case ever tries to throw it out and uh, create a problem for you. Uh, and, and that will be the Fair Labor Standards Act, where the federal law uh, governs overtime payments and things like that. And some of you are looking at me like you already know what I'm talking about. I'm sure you do. Where the government is supposed to pay you for the hours that they allow you to work or know that you're working. You're working in a crime stopper situation where you don't have a, a, a schedule that's all that regular because you'll you'll work your your time at the, at the at the agency and then you'll go out to the crime stoppers event you'll attend their meeting you'll go to a conference all these things that if you really get down to the definition of it it's hours work for which your employer is supposed to compensate you either with compensatory time off or with time and a half overtime and most of the time they don't pay that, but, but you need to be prepared to uh, manage that or deal with that. In nearly every case I see, uh, it, it's like you, the, the chief or the sheriff or the head of your law enforcement agency knows that you won't get money for it, but maybe you'll get a meal at the, at the, at the Crime Stoppers function. Uh, maybe you'll get a plaque from the board and that you're happy and that you're not doing it. Now, I never think that they should assign people to work in the Crime Stoppers position from the agency because they think you're, you're, a, you're a goof up or, or because they think you, they don't want you on the street or doing it. I don't, I, it takes a special person to be a Crime Stoppers law enforcement uh, coordinator and do the job. We, we don't want rejects there and you don't want to feel like you're being put there because they don't trust you. But uh, long story short, uh, unless somebody is the, is the complainant and the person is working the overtime, they put in a, 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 a claim for the FLSA overtime. Uh, of course, normally they'll get transferred out of there at the discretion of the agency. There may or may not be restitution or, or excuse me, retaliation claims filed. But it's a little bit of minutia, a little bit of trivia. But I would say handle that delicately. If the, if the question comes up, you're free to call me. I, I deal with the FLSA questions a lot and represent you guys through the, the, the police and law enforcement union. So, but uh, you are in a special position where you're going to work more hours than other people do. Uh, it may not be hard work. So it may be very hard work, but something to think about. Uh, some uh, other areas, and, and, and uh, Dave will, I think, really enjoy getting into this. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Brady issues. You may want to... Uh, talk a little bit about Brady and, and some of the things that will sometimes come out where people want to know if Crime Stoppers receive some information. In a way that's connected to yes. what your situation was. How many are familiar with Brady? It's about uh, Brady's essentially a responsibility of prosecutors to, um, I always get confused, Judge, and say exculpatory, exculpatory. What are the statements that make defendants look good called again? Th those, those are... Well, the, the defense, see, I never think of a defendant looking good. That's right. That's why I never learned if one that word. were to, I never, it's, uh, it's, it's here, here's what I, I used to say. Right? It, it's supposed, inculpatory means they're bad guy. Exculpatory means, hey, I didn't do it. Or, or the other thing that I like to, if I get to talking about uh, uh, the, the exculpatory, I say, 
In most of our cases, Crime Stoppers doesn't have anything that shows the guy didn't do it. Uh, uh, what we sometimes happen is, is at best they'll say, I'm sorry, I, I got caught, or, or it really wasn't as bad as it looked. That, that's about as close as you come to exculpatory. The exculpatory information is information that suggests that the defendant did not do it. In other words, not every evidence that we generate is helpful to our case. Some is hurtful. Brady puts a tremendous responsibility on prosecutors to make sure that they release all this information to defendants and their counsel, which indirectly puts pressure on you because if you don't give the information to the prosecutor, that is exculpatory and it's going to be a problem that will come out of your office, which is one of the reasons we want our police reports to be as thorough as we can. We want as the DAs to be able to sift and decide what our strategic strategy is, but we can't do it unless we know everything. Uh, so uh, the Brady uh, laws are pretty vigorous, let me say. Uh, well, and, and, they, and it seems like they're tough. It's growing. And, and what it is more is, popular than ever. Or, and, and it's your prosecutor coming to you. It's, it's not so much a defense counsel. Right. It's the guys that you deal with every day. They're saying, we want anything you've anything. got. And then the officer is going to probably go back to Crime Stopper and say, do we have anything that shows this guy didn't do it? And usually say, we only have stuff that shows he did do it. But but here's uh, an area you got to watch out for. Or it could even be the own misconduct of an officer. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that. The, uh, the, the, the area that uh, may come up is that you may have so many calls or tips that come in that say somebody else did it. We had the, the Green River serial uh, killer uh, a, a number of years ago. And they, they had this uh, regional, then nationwide TV show on it, and they got thousands of calls. And there were some of those calls all said that a certain person did it. Like there were 450 calls that said this one guy did it. And so Crime Stoppers had to tell the criminal defense attorney that there's 450 other people that says it was this other guy who's not even the guy who we think is the suspect and, and, and on trial. So you've got to be careful in, in, in what you deal with there if, if you're getting too many calls coming in or too much uh, in, information. You have to screen and decide uh, maybe, for example, that's a good reason to uh, have, have a, a policy adopted as far as record retention, how long do you keep it, if it's garbage, do you, do you flush it or, or, or toss it. But those are things. But the, the other area that, that I think Dave uh, can help us with is the area of, of officer misconduct. I, I can tell you that recently in, in, uh, in Dallas County, Texas, uh, there's a judge there who's very liberal leaning, which is unusual for Dallas, Texas, but uh, who is allowing defense attorneys to uh, have every officer that testifies in, in, in our court uh, give information that's otherwise protected by law, their name, their address, their date of birth, everything that will give all the information where they can get what they want from all the data banks. And, and they're also gathering any uh, uh, sustained disciplinary charges involving untruthfulness. And so, Dave, you want to uh, go Just into that? Just to say that, that uh, you know, you have a case, you might have a witness, a star cop witness, who eight years ago uh, was disciplined for three days for a miss statement in their report, that is exculpatory because that goes against the credibility of a person who is pointing the finger at their client. And that's the kind of information that has to be shared with the prosecutor so that they can share it with the defense. And then they can work. They can work in their motions and limine. They can argue that its probative value is far away by prejudicial, but it's up to them to do that. Yeah? Well, it's a United States Supreme Court case. Um, I don't know the uh, facts of it, but it involved sanctions against the, the state because they did not disclose exculpatory evidence. I think it was about 1969 decision. But you're right. It's, it's, it's for some reason it's picked up a lot of steam recently. And so what we have is some chiefs of police, some some uh, heads of law enforcement agencies are going too far and they're using it as an excuse to terminate the employment of law enforcement officers. Well, you do officers. have your labor hat going, I can tell uh, it. Yeah, it's, it's flowing now. 
Because they and what it is, we're all state workers in Wisconsin. And it's so almost, we're beaten down. It's right almost now. bad blood because you <laughs> we say gave that up. But so you say, Chief So and So couldn't get rid of you for untruthfulness, and your labor lawyer got you off with the arbitrator. So we're stuck with you. However, now we're going to take a second shot at you four or five years later by saying, you know, I talked to the DA. I told him what a sorry piece of crap you were. That you're dishonest, and I'm just stuck with you. I can't get rid of you. Prosecutor says he can no longer vouch for your credibility, so you're no good to me as a peace officer. So you want to resign? So we're having that kind of stuff. There's we do, a have, we, we do have cases though where officers yep. get reassigned yes. or removed from sensitive crime investigations because right. they're cooked. Yeah, they got one of those and they'll come up every time, and it's too much to overcome. And you try to re rehabilitate as best you can, and and if you ever get anything that talks about untruthfulness, failure to discuss, there's all sorts of untruthfulness. So, some is that you, you were truthful in what you told, but you didn't tell something that they reasonably expected that you should have disclosed. Uh, fight that as, as much as possible, or to get the wording changed. I don't care if you give me 30 days without pay, but don't make it for untruthfulness. Make it for uh, uh, failure to perform duties or what, whatever. Sound, anything sounds better than the untruthfulness. So, so think about because you might be fine in your agency right now, but another department head may come along who, who goes to a seminar where it's all pro-management and, and everything and anti-workers and labor. And they may say, "Hey, this is a great way to get way of uh, get get rid of uh, Goober." So, so watch those things. I saw a hand. Uh, question. No, I, was, I believe it was a drug case. Brady. Yeah, Brady was a drug case where the defense brought up that the officer had been disciplined for untruthfulness on the job and brought it up at trial. And That's the major problem, uh, and it is true. That, but the judge says that the police departments have to think about it proactively when they're doing discipline as to what the discipline is for, because some disciplinary proceedings uh, carry with it very negative, uh, negative stigma and others do not. Uh, but it is very important for the prosecutors as well to know this information. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate, because sometimes you'll have an excellent officer who has one bad day in a 30-year career, and the one bad day is eight years removed. Uh, but it's still something that your prosecutor's got to know about. Yeah. So if I take a, say we arrest somebody for armed robbery. All right. They're in, they're in jail waiting for a prelim. Okay. And a crime shop reporter, and they get, say we get two calls saying it's somebody else who's the one that committed this armed robbery. So am I obligated to provide that to the DA? I would tell it to the DA, but but you're hoping that the DA will be able to, to put it in the proper context. The DA is the one who has to this decide whether they disclose it and account for the judge. I'm presuming from the nature of your question that there were calls that you did not take seriously, that nothing behind them. And, is that correct? Well, I'm just, I, it hasn't happened. I'm just asking. Yeah, hypothetically, it depends. It could be that the call is very substantive and you have concerns about who you have. That's one issue. And, and sometimes we avoid the whole thing because we've had cases, that, there's a, a case in Texas called the Possum's Pickaxe Murder. There's a store, convenience store stop in Ross called Possum's. And uh, oh, a guy uh, robbed it, this is only in Texas, I guess, carrying a pickaxe as a weapon. In Wisconsin, he drove right. the pickaxe through the attendant's head, and it was stuck in the floor and couldn't pull it out and left it with the evidence. But they arrested three, three uh, men for that crime on a Crime Stoppers tip, and then later learned that they had the wrong guys, and Crime Stoppers, a uh, second Crime Stopper tip, freed those. So... Sometimes what you do is you brag about your mistakes before anybody else can say it's a mistake. And what we said was, Crime Stoppers freed three innocent men for who were After falsely Crime Stoppers used. freed yeah. three innocent <laughs> <laughs> So, but we, we put our spin on it. Just a little. <laughs> yeah. Reminds me of my cousin Vinny. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, Mike, but again, that's down yeah. south, Judge. Yeah, yeah. Where, Sometimes. Where men are men and laws are not. <laughs> and I once did... Just to disclosure, I once did prosecute a guy for uh, having sex with a mature male brown goat. And you might think, well, that's oh, a nice that story. story. <laughs> just, uh, this story ended up in U.S. District Court. Judge Higginbotham, who later moved up to the Fifth Circuit, U.S. Court of Appeals, 
where there was a guy on the stand testifying against Sierra, and I said, but is it not true that you're the same Jesse Thomas Ball who had sex with the mature male brown goat? And he says, yes, but I was drunk. But anyway, you can <laughs> discredit where you can. Does it matter if the goat's mature or immature? It was the, <laughs> it was the male. From where I'm sitting, it's eccentric either way. Yeah, it's all about it. You know, this morning I knew we were going to talk about goats yeah. growing. And I, and I do encourage you tonight, it's on my notes list, two things that we also have in common as speakers. We both only have one A in our last name and... It's okay if you buy him a drink uh, during the, uh, the cash bar tonight. I won't. I won't be jealous at all. I've had my share. So, <laughs> so I don't care how many drinks you buy me. That goat ain't looking good. <laughs> <laughs> a difference between Dave and Jesse Thomas Law. That's about it. <laughs> Another. Yeah, by area. the way, one of your witnesses has had sex with a mature goat. That's something you do disclose yeah. <laughs> under Brady. See, we had all of this plan to be circuitous and take us right back to drive that point home. Okay, now away from the farm and back to the uh, courtroom. I'm still uh, working on go down more. <laughs> ethics and crimes. We talked a little bit about this. Handling reward money. Sometimes the board of directors will tell you that they want you to handle the money. I've seen some Crime Stoppers boards that even designate, however they do it, they designate the law enforcement officer as the treasurer and they give you the book and let you do the bookkeeping. Something gets messed up, a, an accounting error or whatever, who, who do they nail, who do they go after? You, uh, the peace officer. I've seen people lose great careers over accounting errors that looked like they were ripping off Crime Stoppers when they just couldn't add and subtract or they didn't know. You put the negative, you put the negative or the plus in before the uh, the, the equal mark, and they didn't know, and, and, uh, and a career was lost. The other thing, seen people who were in bad situations. Uh, uh, one uh, female detective was uh, uh, literally dying of cancer, had uh, some bills that were not covered by uh, uh, insurance, so she would sort of float loans by. She was allowed to handle the cash that was to be given, so. She would borrow some of the cash from the Crime Stoppers uh, and delay uh, handing out the, the, the Crime Stoppers rewards so that she could pay some bills with it. And ultimately, she had a uh, dishonorable uh, uh, termination uh, right before uh, she went off to die. And just terrible things if you're in a bad situation. So, I mean, why put yourself in, in a position where it's not your responsibility to run the the, the financials for, for the organization. You're there for your law enforcement connections and skills and everything, not, not, to, not to be their cashier. So, so I, I say, uh, not, not trying to knock the boards, but don't let yourself be put in situations where it's either not your job, it's a misuse of your talents and your skill and your profession, and it's an opportunity where there could be mistakes that have uh, harmful consequences. Yes. Does that affect your recommendation for the scholastic We've actually had five scholastic uh, coordinators that I'm uh, aware of that were prosecuted and lost everything they had in law enforcement for being for because somebody says, well, you're you're their uh, uh, you're their sponsor. Well, it probably should have been somebody at the school. Well, the, and, and and the people keep up. Uh, I even saw a judge once who had a juvenile program that was working. And he kept all the money that they they earned from mowing lawns and. And he was supposed to pay it out for rewards and the diff different things to uh, honor these kids. And he didn't account for everything, and, and he lost his judicial pension and everything. So, so bad things happen when you deal with money that you don't have to deal with. So, so I, I really recommend that you be careful about that. Now, sometimes it's intentional. The uh, police corporal in Dallas, Texas. Oops, I, I was not, I was just going to say the name of the city and not the state, but. Anyway, Dallas. Well, we said Dallas. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, you, but there's Dallas, 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 Missouri, and a few others. But yeah. and one of the Dallases, for five years, she skimmed money off of Crime Stoppers and took cases that other officers actually solved, wrote it up as an unsolved case, then used their information, told the board of directors to approve the payment. The, the payment was then authorized to be made at the, at the bank, and people collected. 
So for five years, she'd been ripping them off with the use of a co-conspirator who was not a police officer who would go to the bank and collect it. The feds, when they get a case, I, I, I mean, not to say anything about the state prosecutions in the various states, but, but the feds always want a sure case as possible. You know, they'll, they'll just let people keep selling and killing and everything for four or five years, and they'll videotape. So if they've got a, a room full of evidence where you can't, you can't dispute it and you plead out in so many cases. Well, in, anyway, they had five years of, of, of evidence on this, and they come in and they arrest her. I mean, everybody says, you know, how stupid. Then a month later, the same thing happens in Miami, Florida, where the crime stop was going there. So, uh, just, I mean, having a bad day, having a, don't throw it all away. Don't throw it all away. Because you would think things like that wouldn't happen, but they do. And there are people that, just like the people that you'd go to school with at the academy, you'd, you know, be in the locker room with, go out on calls with. And, and it, it's their worst nightmare, their worst nightmare. Uh, there was a guy who was a member of the board of directors of Crime Stoppers International who was a law enforcement captain in, uh, in the state of Tennessee. He uh, won the award as, quite, uh, as the Crime Stoppers Coordinator of the Year. As a matter of fact, he reported statistics that were higher than his agency reported to the FBI. He, he solved cases they didn't even have. And uh, wh where he got busted, though, was he was selling drugs to the to the drug syndicate that were seized and housed in the police property room. So, and he was running the Crime Stoppers program. We well, made, fantastic. We made him give back his plat because it, not that he could hang it up in his FCI room, but uh, uh, all these horror stories. The thing to remember is there there could be a moment where, where whether it be like suicide, where you say. Well, everybody thinks about it one time, even if it's only for a second. They say, I'm not that crazy uh, or not that depressed. Well, sometimes people have thoughts. Get them out of your head because you can't get away with it. Maybe for so long, but it's not worth it. Yes. I guess, Doug, what other people are going to do other crime stoppers? How do they handle prescription drugs? Because the law organization, I do, that's the only money I can, I do handle with prescription payments is two officers to pay. Okay. I, I would recommend that's any, the program, the $50 per test. Yeah, really yeah and, and it's good that, that you're looking to lower amounts that don't cause problems and so forth, but I recommend that you use any innovative method that, that keeps it from having to be delivered by uh, the, the police officer. If you can throw it off on the teachers, I guess maybe that, that's one step <coughs> removed and you're out of well, it. They, they do that, but you know, it's, I mean, generally that I, I think have, I think that's manageable. We have, we have several checks and balances. I think it's right. good. I can always cover it. I already always check those. That, that's good. Just, Here, here's what's happening after the federal indictments. There are schools where they talk, whether it's law enforcement schools or whether it's crime stopper schools, where they're trying to get the, uh, the, the people who do handle money prepared for the possibility and the people who recommend uh, the reward packs. Be, be prepared for the possibility that they might say, we're going to routinely give you a polygraph examination periodically to ask you about did you funnel tips, did you, did you skim money, did you embezzle. Uh, uh, if you're a subject, meaning a person who's fit to take a polygraph examination, because we know that even though polygraph examiners will say they can adjust for blood pressure, there's some people that just aren't fit for it. So. But, that's, but, why, but, that's why they're still not admissible in court. Right, right. Uh, and, 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 and all it does there's is... there's a psychopath it, that will beat that. It measures physiological responses. And what I've found, and I've participated in probably 2,000 polygraphs in one way or another as a prosecutor or, or police advisor or, or union attorney, and what we found, some, a lot of my clients show the reaction not because they're deceptive or they're fearful that they'll get caught out, but they're pissed off, they're mad. Some polygraph examiners know how to press the right button. Sometimes it's just a tool. It's just a tool. It can help, it cannot. I saw a guy fail a polygraph exam. Well, actually, excuse me, pass a polygraph because he showed no deception when he admitted to being 
one of the assassins of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the president. The only problem was he wasn't born until eight years after the president was assassinated. That's a, that's a tough detail. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, There's no Brady responsibility to disclose that. The defense lawyer hasn't caught that. He deserves what happens. But I digress. Some other, we're, we're just about to the point where we're going to let you ask questions. I mean, I'm still working off the goat. I mean, <laughs> just, <laughs> the goat will stay with you. And if it's Cabrito, watch out. It'll give you heartburn. Okay? Sure. Can I, I'm going to ask a stupid question because I don't know, I confess I don't know the mechanisms of crime stoppers as well as many of you do. Um, the way that money works, like with the kids, the $50 programs, um, how do they collect their money and preserve their anonymity? How is that done? Who's the money? How, how is it done? By, by us, it's, uh, they just go to the administrator's office and the administrator will give them $5, $10 bills. But how does the administrator, how do you know that's the person who's got the money coming? Or some kind of code system, or what? Yeah. For, not even by us. For us, again, the kid goes to the administrator and hopefully can maintain their end. It's end more at risk. That. It's more at risk. Yeah. But what about adult collection? Let's say I've given you a good tip. I really want to be anonymous, and I'm lucky, like the Beloit case. It fled out. My anonymity was never uncovered. And it's a homicide. I got a thousand bucks coming. How do I collect a thousand bucks without you knowing who I am? By, by us, we, we give you a code number, and we go Where's to it? a bank. And you go and you say, I'm here for envelope 12-06. And you can send somebody else if you want to trust them with your code, and it's not even you. Our, if our, our bank player. works with us. Our bank. It is tricky, though. It's right. Tricky. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But our, our, bank is, our bank is good with us. Our treasurer will go there. Hey, we need we need a 1000 bucks. But it's a cash. check made. It's cash. It has to be cash, right? It's got to be cash. Yeah. We need 1000 bucks cash, 50 bucks cash, whatever the case may be. And then that person just goes to, right to the receptionist and says, I'm here for envelope whatever. Man. Surveillance guy wouldn't be comfortable, yeah. But you're using the code number as the key to we got the right guy, get the right one. And they'll often couple the number with maybe a color, green or blue or whatever, in case some other informant is trying to guess what number they're at. <laughs> because two days before they were number 128, even though... They don't know how the numbers are assigned. Some of them will play that game. And where's the where's the cash come? Fundraising, fundraising okay. donation. And in some in some jurisdictions, there's some court generated revenue, where or legislation authorizes them. people to pay into the court clerk uh, a one time donation or fee that's given to Crime Stoppers. That's in probably about 18 to 20 states right now, which is providing literally millions of dollars in Florida and Texas, Mississippi, and a few other states. Uh, but, you know, so a, lot of, a lot of times there's strings attached, too, where the state makes you do certain reporting, and some people want to play the game, some don't. We have a bill that I know we just got budgeted yesterday to be amended, and to change that to allow for uh, it's, uh, $20 for misdemeanor convictions and $50 surcharge for felony convictions, in all of them across the board. Across the board. Grab a piece of that for the practice. It's very good, but it can be political in that unless there's legislation. Yeah, yeah, make sure make the money is going to go straight to the crack right? Yeah. The, the clerk will take a slack fee for handling right. it to keep them happy. But, right. but and then we get our cut because we present that, that's, that right. That. that's right. That's <laughs> right. Free drinks. Diane? Yeah. And, and a lot of times, the, the schools will have two separate rates. You know, if I'm a student, Diane, and I say, I do not want to be known, I don't want to be confidential, right. I want my 50 bucks because I did my job. Directly, you don't go to the school and you go to the code system again? Right. You either text it, web tip, or you call But I'm a 14-year-old kid. I can go into a bank with a code and get money? One of the things I always or worry, send my dad there because I don't want the surveillance. Right. And then and then see that's another thing with with the with the young people. I used to get into this over somebody say a young person wants to claim a reward not through the school program but they solved the homicide and you've offered say a flat fee as opposed to a, a flexible uh, a range of a, a, a reward. You say we're paying 
thousand dollars they were selling. Well, if you advertise a thousand and it's not up to a thousand, but you're saying a thousand, it's a law of contracts that applies. And unless you put a term and condition that qualifies us, if you're if you're a minor, the, the, the most will pay you is two hundred dollars. If you're if you're an adult, you, it's like somebody mowed your yard. If you say I'll pay whoever mows my lawn sixty dollars, and then a little kid comes in and says, Oh, you're too young to give sixty dollars. Here's ten. You, you you have to keep the contract. Well, the other part that I worry about is is if you tell somebody you can remain anonymous and then you say, but you've got to tell, you're not totally anonymous because you've got to tell your dad or parent or somebody else, or you've got, to me that's changing the contract term. So we have to be careful about that. And the other thing is whenever we first expanded Crime Stoppers into the schools mm -hmm. and we're dealing with minors, we're thinking, Let's be careful because some people have them in grade school or elementary school. I like to, uh, I prefer the high school. I understand the middle school or junior high, but you have to think about the maturity level of the children. They're a lot more mature now than they were when I was in school. I know that, but but are these people going to be able to handle the anonymity? Are they going to be able to keep it a secret that they've received a reward? Are they going to keep it a secret that they gave information? And we always struggle with this and, and have to do everything we can to protect the children, even against themselves. I'm just curious. 50 bucks gets them going? It's enough to get them into it? Yeah. Okay. yeah. We get a lot of quick 50s, but it always makes me nervous because they'll say, I'm the treasurer, so they'll say, we need 50 bucks in an envelope, take it to the school with the initials on it. Well, you're putting the initials on it, I'm assuming it's the kid's initials. Yeah, that's the first step towards the loss of anonymity. Yeah. I wouldn't do that because okay. also... How would you handle with it? How would, you know, I know, what I usually do is I take it to the school and I put the envelope and then I have the whoever I give the money to at the school sign a thing saying they received the envelope with $50 in it. Yeah, I it makes me nervous about putting initials yeah, on it. Would, I wouldn't do that because people figured out it's like going into internal affairs. They don't want you to know which officers they're, they're investigating. So in one department, they used to write the initials of the officers, and everybody knew there was one guy named QR, and everybody knew he was the only Q. They knew he was being investigated. Well, kids can figure out. I don't, I don't like the idea of, of, of the uh, the initials. I don't either. Who would tell you what, you initials, have who would tell you what initials to use? Sometimes we use case numbers. Why would you translate it into a number? Why would you go to some kind of code or something? Yeah. Well, that's why it always makes me nervous when, this, when the, I get the yeah, initials. Do you guys uh, have kids' phones? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Oh, that's right. The thing is, with every quick 50, we generate a quick 50 tip number. I think that's a quick code number. That's good. Yeah. 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 yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, initials is the. We have, I think we're going till 3.15, or is it 3 o'clock cut off of the break? 3.15. 315? One five. Oh, so we're right at the we so we've possibly gone over. Can we just do one more question uh, on anything? There's another subject after us then. Any final question? But but this was fun. As you know, we rehearsed, we memorized all of this uh, to make it look like it's impromptu. We're gonna do the same exact uh, presentation next year on a different topic. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you. And any, I have enjoyed any, working with Dave. Any, other, any other straggling questions or whatever? All right, this, after, this evening of the banquet, I guess I'll talk a little bit, although not too much, because it's a banquet about anonymous and confidential informants. And the judge is going to be around tomorrow in the panel, aren't you? I'll, I'll, I'll be uh, here tomorrow. And we're here all, all day. And, um, you know, if you want to buy me a drink, who am I? Please, please, please do. But put it in an envelope with my initials. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good job, man.